My name is Kat Smyth. I'm with the Calgary Horticultural Society. And with me today is my friend, Joanna Studi. She is a horticulturist and she is a landscape designer. And here we are, hopefully we are gonna be able to watch and do some questions and answers. And I know there's been some questions already posted that we could probably answer. So Joanna, yeah. I knew that we were talking mulch earlier. Yes. So what I was thinking was this lady or this person has sent us a question. I have mulch over my perennial bed. How do okay. I fertilize? How do I fertilize? Okay. And com and add compost with mulch on top. Okay. Oh, so geez. I could probably show you. Uh, uh, <laughs> let's take advantage of technology. We're in Joanna's garden, just yeah. so you know. She's out <laughs> wandering in her garden. I'm a little. Yep. I'm waiting to see how she's going to do this without losing her comb. <laughs> okay. Well, if you can't see the video, tell me. It's pretty windy, but let's give this a shot. All right. So I've got my strawberry plants here. These and are the most from the leaves and that from last year. And what I would do is now I would go ahead and just pull some of those leaves back and I would find the base of my strawberry plant and I would take some aged compost and just go ahead and put it around the base. And then I would brush all those leaves and mulch back into place and just let them be. Good explanation. Show and tell. Very good. Very so, good. I mean, that's how I do it. I just, I'll pull the mulch back. Um, I try not to do that too early because I know there's beneficial insects overwintering. Ladybugs are just starting to wake up now on our hotter days. Yes. Um, and yeah, I just put down whatever fertilizer. I like to use aged compost, but whatever people are using. And then I just push the mulch right back over top because it'll continue to deter weeds and hold in moisture and look nice for the rest of the season. Yes. And that's how I do that. So it's a little bit of labor, but we all want to get out and tinker in the garden. So that's that's how you can do it right now. We, we certainly do. I have a little tiny leaf rake and I'll pull my mulch aside and yep. I just put my compost almost exactly like that. Just sometimes you've got to work in among your perennials to do it. Yep. So that's exactly what I would do. Good. Now, one of the other questions <laughs> that I noticed, is it time to rake my lawn? A little glitchy. <laughs> Raking your lawn. Oh, we're not getting. I'm just having trouble here. Everything oh. kind of froze there, Kath. Okay. I... The next. Are you there? Yep, I can hear you now. Okay. The next question was about raking my lawn. Is it time to rake my lawn? Okay. I would say no. Nobody likes that answer because everybody wants to get out and do yard work right now. But the tender new um, blades of grass that are coming up right now are just too, um, they're too fragile. So if you get going with a big leaf rake um, or, a, or a lawn rake for dethatching, you're going to damage those new blades. So I would wait a little bit longer, at least one or two more weeks. Okay. You can fertilize right now. Um, you can get your hose going if you want. Uh, but I would just hold off a little bit longer just so that you're not damaging those new blades of grass. Okay. All right. <laughs> now, now we're going to switch topics a bit. Okay. What is it? Is it too soon to put your potatoes in the ground to plant your potatoes? Not getting any audio. Okay. Seems to be a little glitchy. Okay. The next question was about potatoes. Okay. And what they want to know is, is it too soon to cut, to plant your potatoes and do you cut your potatoes? Okay. So I have not put potatoes in the ground yet. I'm going to wait. I know there's a saying or there's um, some phenology around lilac bushes. Do you know, Kath, that you wait for your lilacs to leaf out, then that's when you can start to do potatoes. Am I right? That's the one. That's for okay. the north. That's for the north country, and it has the. It's the same thing. I don't know why that the old time gardeners use lilacs as their part of their phenology because the other one I know is when the lilacs are in bloom, you mm -hmm. prune your junipers. Have you oh, heard okay. That? <laughs> that all rhymes really well. That goes good alliteration. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> I think they're great. Some of these things are really easy to remember and not yeah. so easy to remember. Right. So 
thank you for helping me remember about the lot. I can remember leaves or flowers, but it's um, leaves first. And that's when you do your potatoes, but do you cut okay. your potatoes to plant them? I do. So I'm really thrifty. Um, I like to say if I have two eyes on the chunk uh, of however I've cut it, I will put it in the ground. So I know a lot of folks don't cut their potatoes. They just put them right in and they have great success. And I know others who do cut and they also are successful. So I think it's personal preference for me. I like to make sure, um, I don't know, they're like two inches square roughly um and as yeah. long as i've got two eyes on there i feel pretty confident that it'll turn into a, a producing plant now my irish brother-in-law yes <laughs> tells me that he... with an irish brother-in-law about potatoes. no you don't because he's very opinionated but yes. he cuts and then he lets them dry for about two days yep. before he plants yep. them Yep. So that's a good point. Thank you. Um, I have done it in the past when I was a newbie gardener where I just sliced them and threw them in and I noticed that they didn't grow quite as well or produce quite as much. So it is something in that drying out, that slight curing that really helps them probably, um, it somehow probably signals more root growth. Okay. All right. I kind of, I kind of have this thing about potatoes in general. So now <laughs> what can a person direct seed in their garden right now oh darn in their vegetable you. garden okay so i i missed the middle but i think you said what can we direct so right now yes yes yeah, and you're glitched out again um, yes i said that can we take a quick pause we're just going to figure some no stuff out we're taking a pause joanna okay okay <laughs> It's a little glitchy, Kath. I, I can hear you and then it and then your your video freezes and I can't yeah. get any audio. And I think they're just working on something here. Okay. Okay. I don't so know we'll just, that, we'll just pause with the sound for just one second, okay? okay. Okay, I think we're good. Joanna, you're still with us? Yep, yep, I'm here. Perfect. Continue on, ladies. I just have a question from Gail and she wants to know, should she cut back her perennial grasses? Um, you, yeah, absolutely. So now's a good time. What the main thing is, um, I've got some Carl Forsters and blue oat grass I'll be cutting back soon. Um, you just want to make sure you do it before that good new green growth comes on. Um, I think you still have some time, Gail, but I, you could do it now. It's fine. One of the tricks that I've learned about cutting grasses back, especially Carl and some of the others, is I take a piece of string and I tie it around so it's a really tight bundle. Yep. And yep. then I just cut below the string and then I don't cut into anything that might be coming. That's a good idea. It takes it off nice and easy and it cleans it and then you just run your glove through it and it cleans out the debris. That sounds perfect. Well, it sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> How do you know that it's time to plant in your raised vegetable garden? Okay, that's a, um, oh, how do you know? That's such a great question. Um, yes. Trial and error. <laughs> <laughs> trial and error has led me to get a feel for it. But when I go, so I'm gonna go right now over to my raised beds. Um, when I go to my raised beds and I, um, let me see if I can turn this around and I've got, um, just nice. I can work my hand into the soil. There's dampness there, but it's not cold. I was in here the other day and I had my shovel going and I, I hit something solid, which I know is frozen soil about six inches down. So, um, I went ahead and put, um, I like to cheat a little bit. So I was showing you earlier, I've got this black plastic mulch 
uh, which, which helps. And then I also um, have some old greenhouse paneling and like an old patio door. Um, and I just figured the sort of, I just lay them on my beds and it kind of cheats a little bit. It, it captures some of that uh, moisture and heat from the daytime and carries it over through the night so that I can get a little bit more um, heat in that soil and I can work it a little bit sooner. Um, I would say, even if your garden beds are workable, things beyond um, that question we kind of just missed with our audio cutting out. So yes. like spinach, peas, um, pretty much a lot of things in the cabbage family could go in, like kale can go in the ground now. You could even be adventuresome and do lettuce. My, my kale's up this much. Awesome. So yeah, I have kale. I'm so excited. <laughs> I nearly <laughs> had a party this morning. <laughs> I would say anything that doesn't form a head in the cabbage family. So yes, um, kale, collard greens, um, um, other like arugula I put in, I put in mizuna, um, just any kind of leafy green is probably okay right now. Okay. Um, yeah. And so you can get those in now uh, with raised bed. I don't know, generally May long weekend is, or middle of May, weather permitting is kind of when you get the rest of your annual veggies. Well, in. you know, my um, raised vegetable garden, I have a compost thermometer. Uh -huh. So it yep. goes down about, oh, 20 inches. Yep. And two days ago, the temperature in my raised bed was around 14 at about four o'clock. So that's how much radiant heat was in the soil. Yep. Yep. And this morning, the temperature had gone up and it was already, at, just before I left the house at about 11, it was sitting at 17. So nice. I would say that we're starting to build up warmth. And my bed yeah. is almost 20 inches off the ground, my one raised garden. So I'm seeing where the soil is warming up. So my, so this is, this helps me a bit. And I know this is not gonna, this is no hard and fast rule, but when I feel comfortable to crack the window at night to sleep, I never thought that's of that I, one. Okay. That's when I, know I can't when do I, that. My dog snorts and screams. Oh. Okay. Well, for me, I think as soon as I start to see the nighttime temperatures not um, dip down to where we get really, really heavy frost in the mornings, that's when you can start to really get out there and start working your raised vegetable beds and have a look. Um, dig down deep, see how far down you can go before you hit something frozen. And yes. again, if you, can, if you can get something that will hold that heat longer, whether it's um, like a glass panel, cold frame, um, black yes. mulch, or just regular mulch, that'll help a ton too. That's what I think. Now we have a question about growing flowers in the shade garden. Okay. Any recommendations for colorful plants that are also okay for the shade? Sure. So that's a tricky one, right? Uh, most plants want six hours of light a day. Um, and then if you, if they get less, uh, they tend to not flower as much. So that's why we see a lot of our shade perennials being very beautiful in their foliage and not so much in their flowers, but things like um, ligularia, um, a still bee are gorgeous. Yes. Um, what else? Um, Bethlehem sage. Um, I love my ladies mantle. It's more for the leaf, but their petite little yellow flowers are pretty eye catching. Primrose can handle shade and that's such a gorgeous early blooming um, shot of color in the garden. Kath, I'm sure you have zillions. Well, I was about to say, what about monkshood for the sheer drama at the back of the yes. bed? And now they have that pinky white monkshood. Yeah, that one would be a beauty back there. Yep. And I think um, that would be one. And yeah. I mean, in the spring, I like to, I still like the old fashioned bleeding heart. Yes, I was going to say bleeding heart. That's pink and white or all yes. white. Those are pretty vibrant yes. colors. And, and um, how about um, some of the heucheras like to be in the shade and their colorful yeah. foliage? Yeah, that's true. Um, and they most of those are like either really beautiful purple colored leaves or those crazy chartreuse shots of color. I was color. just going to say the I, chartreuse. They're so gorgeous. Yes, <laughs> and, I, and that's the part that um, I like the best about them. But would you put in hydrangeas in the shade? Yeah, hydrangeas are a good shade shrub. Um, it depends. A lot of them can handle a decent amount of sunlight as well, but there's yes. not a lot of showy, flowery, shade-loving shrubs. Um, you know, like dogwood can handle the shade and yes. coral, ber coral berry, um, but hydrangea, like an Annabelle hydrangea, does quite well in the shade. Yeah, that big showy white flower oh, is pretty. I like the big mop yeah. heads. Yes, 
absolutely. So which animals, animals, <laughs> annuals require <laughs> the least maintenance? Oh, wow. Which annuals require? <sighs> My favorite annuals are the self-seeding kind. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so, um, pansies, um, violets, like Johnny jump ups. I love those. They'll often come back year after year if they're heavily mulched. Um, gosh, things like alyssum. I'm seeding right now, um, just starting to harden off baby blue eyes uh, or nemophila. That's an yes, annual. I was just going to say nemophila is one of my favorites. It's yeah, but a they sell little seed, blue so flower. They're the, they're the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> and have you ever tried four o'clocks? No, With glitchy again. Yeah, you just went again, didn't you? Yeah, I don't know there why. There it that goes. Okay. <laughs> what about four o'clocks? Yeah, I love those. Um, try, yeah, I'm trying to think of other ones. Um, Cosmos. Cosmos would be really pretty. Yeah, and I like them because they do sell seed a little bit. So they can yep. be, and I actually really, really am a big fan of zinnias these days. Zinnias and calendula. I was going to say calendula is another yes. one. Yes. Um, it just, just plant it where you want it. Things like, um, I mean, as you know, like chamomile. Wow, yes. you could not even get rid of that. Um they're all self-seeding, but they, they put on a good show. And as long as you plant them where they're okay to keep coming back, then and, and pretty create pretty cool. a, I like a mass of them. I don't, yeah. you know, I have this 18 foot bed and I just throw seeds in them. Nice. <laughs> now, when, now that the spring flowering bulbs and things are coming up, when is the best time to dig them up and separate them? Oh my goodness. Um, Kath, you might be better at this. I, to be honest, beyond narcissus and daffodils and um, back east when I could grow crocus, I'm really not that into, I'm not really into bulbs. So I gonna let you take that one. All right, I can do that. Now, okay. right now I would be digging my daylilies and dividing them because they are a tuberous root and I wanna take them apart. So once they start to show their grass, I start to separate them and pull them. I don't take my irises up till August because they flower pretty quick here. Anything that's flowering in the spring and into June, I'm not gonna lift and divide, but anything that flowers in the summer months, i.e. Your, your day lilies, I will dig them up. But all of the spring flowering bulbs, once they finish flowering and the leaves start to die back, then you lift up the clump and you can pull them apart and move them around. And quite often I'll dig them up and put them in a shady spot in the garden and then just move them out into the new locations in the fall because that this year's leaves are next year's flowers is how I explain bulbs to people. So that would be how I would go. But anything that flowers right now and into June, I wouldn't lift and divide. I would wait until the latter part of the year. And the same thing, the, sprit, the summer flowering, though, you lift them and divide them is the way I go. Yeah. So now I'll remember that. <laughs> <laughs> now, my next question that I was reading here in our list. Uh, glitchy again. Oh, okay. Okay, I got you now. Okay. okay. What do I need to do to get my seedlings I've started outside? How okay. when do I start taking them outside? Okay, this is a really important point because you've babied those seedlings along. We've all been patient since February, March with our seedlings. So it's called hardening off. Um, you can look that up online or ask friends about it. And what you want to do is introduce them to the outside ambient environment gradually. So you're going to take them in their trays and put them in a place um, out of direct sunlight and out of the wind. Just a really sheltered, nice sort of shady, dappled shady spot. Um, covered sometimes helps a lot. And then just an hour at a time, take them back in after that hour um, and then just do that day after day after day until they seem, until the weather's get warmed up and until your seedlings seem like they can handle that breeze and they can handle a little bit more sun. Um, and then just carefully transplant them into your, into soil. And do you, when you bring things home from the garden center to plant outside, do you harden them off a bit before you put them outside? 
If they've been in a greenhouse, yes, because that temperature is way warmer than my yard um, and the humidity is different in there as well. So um, if I do bring home seedlings from the greenhouse, I would do the same thing. Um, I have already done a couple days outside with my seedlings, but it's still really windy and the sun was really intense that day. So I, I, they weren't out for more than half an hour and I thought, I think I'm going to wait for a couple of weeks and then start again. Yes, because the wind has come up, hasn't it? Yeah. And I was going to leave mine out on the back porch this morning, and I thought, no, I think they've got to come inside because it's just yeah. a little windier than I want to do. And their weather changes pretty quickly, so try and do it when you're going to be home. I wouldn't put them out and then leave all day because um, you just don't know what the weather's going to do. And if, if you came home and, and, and they just got fried in the sun or the wind just laid them all flat, that would be, that would be a sad thing. That's so. right. <laughs> Are you one of these people who grows a lot of tomatoes? Well, so yes and no. I go through years where I, I will buy seedlings because I just don't have time or my seeds weren't good or what for whatever reason this year. Um, I think because of what's going on all around us with, with you know, being at home more and being asked to self-isolate, I just went crazy with my seeding this year. So I have a zillion peppers. I have a zillion tomatoes. Um, well, and we so could swap some. We can swap. I would love to. All mine are heirloom, um, so you can save seed from them at the end of the summer and use that seed again next year. And well, the that's flavor what I try to do. We should do seed yeah. saving for self-sufficiency this fall. I would love to. That When I purchase seed or when I bring plants home with me, I do my best to make sure they're going to not only produce a food item for me or, you know, comp, you know, some other useful aspect, but that I can save those seeds later. I just, I love, like I said, I'm thrifty. So I really love making those plants stretch as far as possible. That's right. That's right. And last year I had a um, tomato that sprouted inside the tomato. Oh, nice. <laughs> so I planted them. <laughs> oh, cool. Very cool. So one of the pepper. questions we've just asked, have been asked is how often do you recommend fertilizing? <sighs> no audio. No audio. No audio. Can you hear me now? Well, I'm going to, there. How often do you recommend fertilizing, Joanna? Okay, uh, really depends what you're fertilizing. Um, generally, the way I do it is I give everything a really big, um, a really big dose of aged compost in the spring, uh, which would be right now. Uh, basically, as soon as you can get outside and pull some of that mulch back and, and fertilize and then maybe um, kind of halfway through summer and I'll lay off the fertilizing um, near the end of summer because I want those plants to finish their life cycle and then begin to shut down for the fall. That's right. What, for, uh, what numbers do you recommend when your fertilizers, in your fertilizers? Well, like I said, I compost a lot, so I just use my compost. Um, I used to use a slow-release fertilizer that was really high in the, um, the phosphate, so really healthy roots and that, um, but I I've weaned myself from store-bought fertilizers. I would say in general, a good like 15, 30, 15, or even okay. a straight 20 would be a good one. But yes. um, I, I really like my aged compost. It, it's I, it's well, a true slow release and it works really well for all my, for my apple tree right down to my annual veggies. Me too. And that's kind of where I've had, I've tried to get away from fertilizer as much and I'm using my compost. What is your favorite carrot? and why oh my goodness my favorite carrot um this is in thanks to the lund family farm um they run lund's organic farm out of innisfail i worked for them for a number yes. of years and they um you know people would come in thinking that they sugared the soil because their carrots were so sweet so they they used to grow a nelson uh variety of it's a nantes variety of carrots called nelson yes i remember it but it hasn't been around yeah. for a while it's discontinued for the last two years but my favorite now is um oh my goodness it's another n name there's a oh i can't remember i can't remember what it is i've got um i just love i just love a straight orange carrot i don't really bother with the the rainbow carrots they're cool looking but the orange carrots a, a scarlet nantes or a nantes variety well, i like one called little finger okay it's so a nice shorter. straight really oh, yeah. nice carrot and it's been around forever 
Bolero I, is another one. I, Bolero is a variety I've used in the past and really liked. Um, hell, I can't remember. If I, if I snuck into my garage and looked at my seeds, I could tell you. <laughs> okay, so how are we going to prevent carrot rust fly this year? Oh my goodness, I move my carrots every year. So they're Me never too. in the same spot twice. Um, and I guess where I, where I grow carrots, I don't tend to mulch very much. Um, they like a really good well-draining soil. Yes. So I, I feel like um, in an unmulched area, and again, just crop rotation as much as possible. That's, I just sort of go preventative. I'm sure there's products out there that would help, but um, I'm kind of a nature girl. I just like to, I like to stop the problem before it starts. Yeah, me too. And I, I tend to use, a friend of mine uses this. He takes a two by six board and he puts a rock on either end of it after he seeds and he just puts them with a rock's depth and there's a board. And he says that keeps the rust fly out because he's got the carrots seeded underneath. Yeah, so I've, heard I that really, I've heard that helps for that and for germination. They like a, yes. they like it to be dark. So that's that's an yeah, old carrots school are dark strategy. germinator. Yes. Yep. Yeah, I put boards down as well. So that that's a great idea. Good, good. I think we're on a track here. <laughs> All right. Now somebody wants to know if we cut back perennial spring or fall. Um, if you got time in the fall, I like to do it in the fall that being said there are some I enjoy seeing through the winter like my ornamental grasses my irises my delphinium um, I notice with especially my delphinium they're a hollow stem and I don't know how they get in there but they are full of ladybugs so I try to leave those because I know the ladybugs are hanging out all winter um, if you can get to them things like hostas and your lower larger leafed perennials are way better to cut back in the fall just so that they're not a slimy mess in the spring and, um, and it, that's one of the places the slugs like to lay their eggs is yes. on your old your hostas so they I love tend to cut hostas. them back yeah, yeah. they just if you can, they yeah. think you put in a condo for them for the winter <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay what flower would you suggest in a hanging pot for a north shade porch she tried oh. a few, they tried a fuchsia but it kept getting a bug Okay. Um, actually, you know what? I have a north facing backyard. Um, I'm in it right now. And there is quite a bit of sunlight that will hit once the sun gets past the building. But um, I love my nasturtium. They do really well in my hanging baskets and they're super hardy. Um, they're very co cold hardy and the hummingbirds love them. Yes, the hummingbirds just come for nasturtiums. They Which love it. Which varietal do you plant in a hanging basket? I love them all. So I have uh, I have the jewel trailing mix. I have the Alaska, um, and I had some seeds hanging out that I saved last year, and I threw those in. So I have no idea what those are anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but they're See, all I like a fuchsia on my north facing front porch. Yeah. My biggest problem there is the wind comes along and the basket yeah. takes a turn, but yeah. I don't get a bug in it. So I find that interesting. But yeah, I, I'm not I sure guess... what that bug would be. Yeah, I am too. I'm wondering if it's is the um, aphid and, and if it is that's usually an indicator that the uh, plant itself is being kept too dry yeah it's a bit more moisture in my mind and I usually put really good potting mix in with my fuchsia so it's got good there you go yeah yeah and that is one of the places that I will use fertilizer is in my hanging pots yes. and my pots because yes. you've got to remember they need, they need that bit of extra nutrition and Absolutely. don't fertilize a dry plant, fertilize a, a moist plant because otherwise they won't take the fertilizer up. Yep. And that's kind of my rule of thumb anyway, so. Yep, you're right, you're totally, and the other thing I fertilize is my lawn. So I have a very small patch of lawn um, and I do use a high phosphorus uh, fertilizer for that. And it really oh. does help quite a bit, so. Yeah, and they do, they do work quite well on that part of it. Um, there was a question from an earlier talk about scarifying my native plant seeds and what okay. kind of sandpaper would you use? Oh, oh what kind? I would, I've even used the sidewalk. <laughs> you use the what? The sidewalk, like just a concrete. Um, it depends yeah. on the size of the seed. So I, I did an experiment with my kids' class on bean seeds because they're a big bean, they're a big seed. Yes. Your fingers, you know. So we um, we put some in the ground without 
uh, nicking the seed coat at all. And others, we use sandpaper, probably a fine grit, like 120 would be totally fine. Um, and then others, we put in a bowl of boiling water until the skins, uh, the seed skin puckered. And then we took them out of the water and planted them. And the ones that did the best were actually the ones that had a little time in that boiling water. So with native, native flower seeds, um, uh, there's a really cool YouTube video if you can find it. It's about you just take like an old um, like yogurt container or any plastic container with a lid. Uh, on the inside of the container, put in um, a strip of sandpaper, whatever grit. I'm sure. Well, I I've heard rough, coarse grit sandpaper to do. If you put your seeds in there, top it, top your container with a lid and shake it. It saves you your fingernails, <laughs> and, it's, and it's much quicker. You can do a lot more at once, and I've, I've had good luck with that. I use an emery board on my squash seeds. Okay, that works. That's a good idea. On the dark brown side, not the light brown side, and you yeah. you file the edges of your squash, not mm -hmm. the pointed end where they grow from, but you file around, and I had the best squash for the last three years. The nice. guy who grows the giant pumpkins in, in Newfoundland, yeah. That's what he does. So now I'm doing that because I'm getting, okay. I got like 20 butternut squash last year. Ooh, wow. That's a I'm good I'm feeling haul. like the squash queen, you know. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> so it's, it's one of those things, but of course, sandpaper, I like the idea of the sidewalk block too. So I think that I think would whatever be you have handy. Yeah. Yeah. I think those are all great ideas. But I never thought of sand sandpapering beans. I'll have to look at that one. Yeah. Maybe I'll get better beans. <laughs> Do you replace your soil in your containers every year? Absolutely. So Absolutely. Yep, just like you say with your annuals, um, do, actually using a store-bought fertilizer in those, I do. Um, I forgot about that, but yes. absolutely it's so critical that you swap out that soil because those annuals have one go and it's just the season and they finish every, every available nutrient is gone by the end of the year with those That's guys. Right. So I call them the show business of the gardening world because they really yep. need that instant, you know, they need the audience reaction. <laughs> so it makes a difference. Now. The, the last thing we, not the last, but one of the questions we've got is how are we going to treat leaf miner? Okay, birch leaf miner. That's a tricky one. Um, at the garden center I work at, we're not even really carrying and selling birch trees anymore just to try and um, cut that, the availability, the habitat for birch leaf miner. I know um, a, a certified arborist would be your best bet. They do an injection, I think it's called tree zone. Yeah. Um, they put it, they do it twice a year, um, spring start. And then I think early summer, um, aside from, aside from the, the injections, I really, and, and not planting birch, which doesn't help you if you already have a birch tree. Um, unless you know something else, Kath, that's. I really, since they've changed so many of the rules, but the best thing I can give recommendations to is keeping your birch tree as healthy as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And that includes watering it in in the fall. Yes. Making yep. sure that it's well hydrated. It needs that extra moisture in the fall because they have a root, they have a vascular system that hauls water fast all year, practically. Yes. There's only yep. one time you cut them and that's in the, in July. So mm -hmm. water, water, water heavily. Yep at least three times a year to keep them well watered. And I agree with that, yeah. <laughs> All right, how do you encourage children to enjoy gardening? Oh my gosh, just make room for them. <laughs> I have, yeah. uh, um, you can't see him, but my seven-year-old is rollerblading on our deck right now. So <laughs> um, <laughs> he's in, he helps me water the seedlings when we, he, he helped me plant, it, plant the seeds. He helps me label them. Um, I ask him to check on them, say how tall are they growing. So I get him right from the start, like in February, I get him involved. Um, my 12 year old is a little less interested, but um, kids are, kids love the garden. Like if you, if you give them room, I, what I would recommend actually is give them their own garden space. If you're yes. doing raised beds, give them their own garden bed or give them the end of one of yours. It's theirs to experiment with. Let them decide what works and doesn't work. You can guide them, you can help them, um, but just let them learn through trial and error and let them understand that that trial and error is really important. Like our failures make us better gardeners. So it's really important that we actually fail 
skill and learn in that way. And kids are so um, in tune with, with just getting in there and, and getting their hands dirty. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Just make so space for them and invite them my, in. My, my thing is that as a young child, I gardened with my grandfather. Yeah. And my grandfather's job for me was two sticks on either end of the row of beets. And then we did carrots. And he thought that that would encourage me a little bit. All it did is make me have a love for straight rows in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> but he always played yeah. a little bit of a game with me and showed me where they went and how to seed them. And that was my favorite thing was to pick the little seeds and plant them. He said, I, I planted the straightest rows. So he made it a bit of a competition. So. <laughs> yeah, and my mom did game. similar things. So mind you, her the idea of a gardening adventure was to take us on a four, a four hour drive to Bowdoin Nurseries to pick up yeah. apple trees. And the oh, wow. reason she took us was so that we would sit in the back seat and hold the trees up so they didn't <laughs> fall down. <laughs> so I love that, Kath, because two really important things about having kids in the garden is make it fun and then yes. give them purpose. Give yes. them purpose. Let them be in charge of holding that apple tree or making those rows straight. And they'll have yes. so much pride. You won't be able to stop them after that. Well, and that's the thing. As I remember as a kid getting in the back garden at my grandparents' house and seeing my straight rows and I would go, I did that. Yeah. No, well, I was always quite pleased with myself with that. Nice. Should you fertilize your seedlings that you've started inside but aren't ready to put outside yet? Should you be fertilizing? So I, um, yes. Uh, short answer is yes. It, it's not going to kill them if you don't. But I, um, just this year, actually, I started fertilizing seedlings. I never have before. And I, I know that that's probably not recommended, but I just never had it and I never used it. Yes. And it didn't seem like anything was lacking. But this yes. year I, I did get... Um, from spruce it up i picked up some evolve um it's the same line that makes rage plus so evolve seedling starter I and i saw love that. It. It, yeah it, it's really weak um and it's perfect for seedlings that are like two inches or taller um just you know we're kind of in that like in the doldrums right now we're waiting for the weather to warm up our seedlings yes. are, are cruising along and we feel like we should be doing something more and a yes. little bit of that fertilizer diluted is all they need and really it's compost tea that's pretty much what basically, it is. basically i was just gonna say i make worm casting tea that's perfect you know, you know and i just water it in um there's a question here and i'm kind of sitting here going a little bit hi i received a liquid fertilizer 1555 orchid liquid plant food are they okay. still good to be used in other annuals and veggie containers i don't see why not um, I don't either i don't see why not and honestly the nitrogen there being the higher number i think that would be good for new growth and yes and annuals are always looking for more food so i think yes. absolutely yeah okay all right all right i'm trying to see if i see more questions here Okay. You can keep going. <laughs> so now that, do you go into the garden center at all these days or do you pretty much stay? No, I do. I do. I was down yesterday looking for samples for composite decking for a client. Um, I try to steer clear. I'm trying to really do my part and keep everybody safe in my household and, and everyone else's that I'm visiting. So I do go to people's yards and do consultations, but we stay we stay two meters apart and some folks just stay right in their house and we have a phone call while I walk around their yard. Um, yes. It's tricky right now, but I think uh, being outside in that fresh air and, and again, just social distancing, um, washing hands like a zillion times a day, keeping out all my tools and equipment, even my phone and everything, keeping it all really clean um, yes. and disinfecting frequently. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I'm up to right now. I, the garden center, um, spruce it up where I work is closed until May 1st. So we've been doing online orders, um, or over the phone and people can either pick up curbside or have it delivered. Um, but we will be opening doors May 1st for an essential service. And so, yes. um, just like in the grocery stores, we'll see arrows on the ground and spacing at the till and we've got plexiglass up already and, we're just trying to keep on in the best, healthiest way we can and make yes. sure people I was, can I stopped at Greengate this morning and the lineup in the parking lot to pick up the curb <laughs> orders is 
they need crowd control outside and they're yeah, not, they can't, they've got to do their safety and get everything ready for public to go in. So a lot of the garden centers are at that stage. And I think it's a really interesting time to be watching all of this, but I can't resist it. They had, they've got windows and you can see into the perennial lot. And I'm sitting looking into the perennial lot going, oh, I'm losing all you those again. New perennials. Oh. <laughs> it's really exciting. All right. Have you have you heard this one, Joanna? I want to try diatomaceous earth on okay. my Asiatic lilies to fight the beetle this year. When right. should you apply that? Right away. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do it on a windy day and and this is where those masks come in handy again. Uh, multitask your, your mask. Um, when you put the diatomaceous earth down, you don't wanna be breathing that. Um, yeah, right away would be ideal. You wanna get that down before, uh, while they're still in the soft bodied phase before they become okay. beetles. Yeah. Okay. Um, in this, this is a question we've had before, but it's when can I start planting in my veggie bed and how do I protect it? And you mentioned you put mul you put things on your beds and things. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you can make a cold frame, even if it's an old window over top of your garden bed, that helps a lot. Um, just a natural mulch helps a lot. Uh, right now is a little early for putting annual seedlings out. I would hold off yet on that and okay. at least get into May and check out the weather then. Okay. Um, I put in seeds. I know my soil is really heavy in organic matter, so it already has mulch kind of mixed in. Um, I'm not too worried about them. They'll come up when they're ready, when the weather allows. Um, yeah, cold frames, again, that black plastic mulch could work, like landscaping fabric could help hold in that heat a little bit. Okay, okay. Natasha, we, got, oh, we have another question. Oh, it's so glitchy. Yes, I was. I was going to buy bulk soil because we have a lot of space. Are there local cubic meter soils that I recommend, like Eagle Lake? I recommend Eagle Lake. You do you guys? Yeah, yeah yes. we actually carry. Um, we carry Eagle Lake's uh, big yellow bags, um, so you can get it from Eagle Lake or from Spruce It Up. Um, any high quality garden mix soil is your best bet. I would say, I love the bulk. Um, I love the bags are really easy. Um, I also love Western Canada compost. I was yeah. just gonna say, and I like Western Canada compost too. And yeah. I, the, new, um, the new mix, not new, they've had it a couple of years from Eagle Lake, the vegetable mix. Yeah. That is a nice mix. I really think that one's a good one. And I, you know, I think it's one of those things. <laughs> It's All right, no. me, so yeah, it works good. <laughs> okay. Do you have any tips on growing radicchio? She loves it, but the price hurts. <laughs> <laughs> it might be more expensive when you factor in your labor. And yeah. <laughs> um, radicchio, you you would plant it just like any other leafy green. Um, I think you can start it a little earlier than other greens, um, like even now-ish would be like- I say actually half was going to say now, yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, I would say now, um, again, like most leafy greens don't need a lot of love. So try not to over fertilize or over water, um, just kind of put it in a shell. It's, it's a, a shorter plant. So put it on the south facing side of your bed. So it gets, it's not block, you know, nothing's blocking it. Um, yeah, I would just say get it going now, um, maybe reserve a few seeds in case we do get like some type of heavy killing frost yet this year and you, you know, you won't be stuck and you can, you can reseed again after the bad weather. I reseeded about three times. So I like to keep yeah. going with radicchio and yeah. I find that I don't do anything but compost or worm tea because I discovered one year, you know how radicchio can be bitter? Yes. If you use a fertilizer that's not is a synthetic fertilizer it takes on a taste even worse than I when it's I, i'm losing you there oh okay anyway i find that the radicchio takes on the taste of the fertilizer quite often so that makes a big difference <laughs> there we are now I the missed next your whole spiel on radicchio <laughs> <laughs> 
anyway, what seedlings should we start now? Joanna, what, what seedlings? Yeah, okay, you're, you're back now. What seedlings Pardon? should we be starting now? Okay, um, it's a little late for seedlings right now. Um, the most recent things I got into pots were my herbs, which I probably could have done a lot sooner, but I missed them. So I have parsley, basil in, um, some cooler, uh, coolers. I put my nasturtium in recently. You can direct sow those, but I wanted a jump start on that. Um, squash is a great one. Winter squash, pumpkins, uh, right about now is great. Or um, I don't know. What else? What do you think, Kath? Well, I was going to say, I'm going to do, I've done my squash just this week and I'm yep. going to do, I want to try uh, cucamelons and I oh, think okay. I'm a little late on them, but I'm going to try them and my, my cucumbers, I'm going to start nice. my cucumbers. Do you think it's late for cucumbers right now or, or um, what do you think I on think that? we're about, we're coming to the end of it because when you look at the maturity date on the seed packets, it actually does mm -hmm. say 90 days to maturity for some of the cucumbers. But if you look at the, the, uh, the little pickling ones, they say 80 mm -hmm. days. So I'm going to try. I, I'm not going to give myself any great hope. And in past, I've grown Diva. And I've had some success okay. with that one. So I do like Diva. Okay. And it is around, seven. no, it's 82 days, 85 days. So I'm going to try okay. those. The, the whole thing is how many days from the time it comes up for you to producing yes. is the number of days yep. to maturity. So I like to look at that. Yeah, yep, that's important. So I sort of am looking at, oh, <laughs> what are some of your favorite indoor plants? Like tropical plants? Yes, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, okay, the ones that I have that have continued to stay alive for me that I have a good relationship with. I have, of course, Sansevieria, so snake plant, um, or mother-in-law's tongue. They call it. I never yes. like calling it that. I don't uh, like calling so I, it that either. No, it's not. I love my mother-in-law. It doesn't look anything <laughs> like her tongue. <laughs> I used to I like have, my my mother-in-law was Irish, and she. She was a character and a half, and I. She never had a bitter tongue. Never. <laughs> oh, nice. Well, the yeah, Sansevieria is like just uh, great in north-facing windows. I've got a spider plant. Um, I love succulents, so I've I have like a succulent orphanage. Anytime I see a a, a little a, like a leaf or a little bit taken off in the greenhouse I'll kind of tuck it in my apron and bring it home with me and I know it'll root in so I have a big jade plant now um, I have a prayer plant that's been doing really well for me I love that one a lot um, I've killed them in the past and for some reason our time is right and and it's doing really well I love my pothos so easy yes, I really mine is grab beautiful yeah, I have a neon yellow one um, that I picked up from the garden center and a, a mini one. Um, I have a lipstick plant. I, I think I because I work in gardening, I tend to go with the easiest indoor plants because when I'm, <laughs> I don't want but anything I, picky. Yeah, I like Hoyas. I have a collection of Hoyas. And yeah. like you, I think I would call my succulent collection an orphanage. <laughs> Whatever I find that broke off at the nursery, I used to like you, tuck it in my apron and go home. I yeah, used to give my mother hex because she used to go to the garden to tour gardens with me mm -hmm. and she'd come out and her purse would be full of cuttings. She made me, oh. it was so embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I have, I have a Chinese evergreen that I really, really like. Okay. Uh, he, his name is Phil and Phil has now <laughs> filled the corner by my desk so Phil and I are going to have an operation this week we're going to separate mm. part of them but okay. I like Chinese evergreens I collect African violets and I have nice. succulents and those are kind of my easy go-to and keep my kitchen looking really pretty nice That's how I like like some of that so okay sweet peas my favorite thing <laughs> sweet peas should start now they should be in yeah. the ground the ground is cold peas like cold sweet peas yep, they can handle this they love it yeah and this is the time when you can go you know yep. it's this give is give them it. something to climb up plant them at a at the base of a trellis and yes 
you really don't need to do a whole lot after that. Just let them kind of come up and then fertilize and water as you would any other plant for the summer. And I just think they're beautiful. And I like to plant three kinds. Mm -hmm. This I attribute back to Barry Erskine <laughs> a little yeah. bit because he always said it and so did my buddy Ruth. You plant the bush knee highs because they're short. Then mm -hmm. you plant the royal family and then you plant the Spencer giants and you get six feet of sweet peas from ground to, to top. Nice. Spence. Full coverage. That's full coverage. And full royal family is the heavily scented. Spencer giant has the longer stems for cutting. My favorites. Nice. So, I'll have to try those. I've never, I've grown um, like sugar snaps and eating peas, but yeah, I- Yeah, me too. I, I mean, my grandma had them and my mom had them, but I've never had room in my garden. So I think I need to take your cue and plant some sweet peas. Well, I have a lifelong love. Here's something my grandpa gave me. He had a 45 foot fence along the one side of the wall wow. in, the, in his garden and it was peas and sweet peas. Nice. So that's where you build your love of it and the smell. And he used to, we used to have an afternoon of eating raw peas and smelling the sweet peas. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds amazing. Do you, Kath, do you know if those inter, do they interbreed like a sweet pea and a sugar snap? Um, they do cross. They will. Okay. They're open, po they're open pollinated. So you do notice a little bit of like grandpa used to get, cause he saved his peas. We would sometimes get colored peas. Oh, wow. right on. Yeah, sometimes they were a pinky tone. It was really so those were those were your own variety then. Those were our varietals. Nice. Cool. Okay, Arctic kiwi. Can we grow that here? Can I show you mine? Yeah. That would okay. be cool. <laughs> okay. It's one of my favorite vines. I'm just going to stand right here in front of it. Here it is Ooh. behind me. So, it's on a like a 12 foot um, post on part of my pergola. And yes, you can absolutely grow them. And I think even they have a variety or they've interbred them so that you can have the male and female in one plant. I'm not totally sure on that. I think they but, have now. I thought I saw yeah. that on a post on the, one of the kiwis last year. So. Yeah, it's um, the, the more shade. Uh, I, I didn't, I planted this six years ago and they only had male and female at that point. So I plant, that's a male um, and my female died, unfortunately. So no fruit. I've never gotten fruit off of because it's a male one. Um, but the, he's pretty shaded and the more shade they get, the more variegation you'll see in their leaves and it's yes. pink and white and it's gorgeous. And their Col flowers, Col Col male and female, both plants yeah. are amazing. They smell like jasmine. They're just intoxicating. They're They're, and the bees love them. So it's a, yeah. it's a beautiful, hardy vine um, that will grow. I mean, I've had it six years and it's... One of the open gardens that we toured that was open about eight years ago. And it grows off of old woods. So you don't yes. have like a hops vine. You have to wait for it to come up from the ground every year. So it's a, it's a really, it, it, it's, it rambles though. So you have to train it back in. You have to keep tucking it back in. Ah, one of the open gardens we toured about eight or nine years ago, they had the male and the female and they had fruit. Oh, and nice. Shaded into, it was shaded by a big pergola and it was just, they were incredible. I was transfixed by it. So they're amazing. I, I grew up in Northern Michigan at, and a garden center I worked at for, I don't know, like eight years. They had this big long fence and they planted it all with um, the Arctic kiwi. And we, I would just go while the guys loaded the trucks and I would just fill with those kiwis they were like the size of the end of my thumb um they're smooth so you just pop the whole fruit in your mouth you don't need to peel it they're yeah not that's that's the oh. ones that i know yes they were so, good. so these folks were telling me about their kiwis and i really like those those were incredible there you go so are we are we um going to touch a little bit on some of the things you're planning to put in your vegetable garden this year? Yeah, I'd love to. So um, I have some classes coming up through Cal Hort. Uh, one yes. is around direct sowing. So I'll be doing that right here in my garden. Okay. Um, so isolating and reaching, reaching the masses through the gardening Zoom okay. class. Um, what have I planted so far? I've got, uh, seedling wise, I've got tomatoes and peppers, probably four or five varieties of each. Um, I have some garlic I'm growing from the, the seed bulbs, the bulbils are called. Um, 
Oh my goodness, what else? I've got winter squash. I love growing um, butternut, acorn, and pie pumpkin. Um, I just try to keep them from apart from each other because they do cross as well. Uh, I put in the ground the other day spinach, arugula, um, my mustard greens, my lettuce. I've got garlic. Um, my perennial crops, I've got uh, strawberries, lovage, asparagus. Uh, chives, borage. Um, I think I counted last year at the end of the season. I think I had 78 different edible crops. Annual wow. <laughs> yeah. So if, if you had a wish for this year's garden season. Yes. And our gardens. Would you, what would you wish? Oh, wow. For like an extra month of summer. <laughs> That's kind of where I'm going. <laughs> I would, okay, I would wish for, my positive wishes would be for, I would just wish that everybody could access a garden space and feel supported in their gardening um, and have the tools and the resources that they need, even if they're just growing lettuce or radishes, so easy. I would wish for uh, more heat um, within reason. And, and good sort of spaced out rainfall. And then my, my negative wish would be no hail, please. And no <laughs> early frosts. <laughs> well, it's been a really interesting hour, Joanna. And I really oh, want to say thank you. And thank you to everyone that's been watching. Thanks and so I have a wish for this garden season. And that is to be able to see other gardeners and talk gardening and visit some people's gardens. Joanna's now has me totally entranced. I'm going to go see it. And, You're welcome anytime. <laughs> and watch our calendar for more things coming up. Thanks so much, you guys.